I think we are online and live. Good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. We're really pleased to be joined with uh, Congressman Tom Malinowski of New Jersey 7th Congressional District. I'm going to host for a little bit. Um, I'm going to take some questions from all of you out there. We're streaming live on Facebook and we're also using the Zoom platform. Um, so my name is Ed Potasnik. I'm Executive Director of New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund, and we work to help New Jersey environmental citizens, both Republicans and Democrats, as well as our independents, uh, to learn about environmental issues and make their voices heard with elected officials. And tonight is part of really talking to a newly elected member of our Congress to see what's happening in Congress and also for all of us to talk about the issues that matter to us so when he's representing us down in Washington, he can know where we stand. A um, couple housekeeping things for you. Um, we're gonna take questions from the applications. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you should click the chat button which it looks like a little bubble for a cartoon. Um, it's at the bottom of your window. And if you don't see it, what you wanna do is you wanna mouse over sort of to the right, you'll see a more with three dots. Click on that and you'll have the option to click chat. If you're watching from Facebook, um, please just type into the chat box on Facebook. Uh, once in a while you can hit a heart or a like, we like to see those as well. Um, but we're really looking for questions for the second part of the webinar. The first part, I have some prepared questions that have come to us from our members throughout the state, and uh, we'll sort of warm up with those. Um, before we get started, I thought it'd be good to share a little bit about what we've been up to in New Jersey with New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. We have three major priorities this year as far as it relates to New Jersey and legislation. Um, the first one being open space preservation. We have um, a constitutional dedication that was supported overwhelmingly by New Jersey voters to dedicate a portion of our corporate business tax back into land preservation. So forest, farms, our parks, um, our coastal uh, parks, which are really important, I think, to most of us, uh, you know, beautiful Jersey Shore. Um, at the end of this year, the calendar year for uh, the appropriation cycle in New Jersey is July 1st. The New Jersey legislature has to pass a bill to allocate those between the different programs. And so that's really important for us. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, had a hearing in the Senate, but it hasn't come up for a full vote in either of the two legislative uh, bodies. Also a big bill for us uh, was clean energy. In New Jersey, Governor Murphy's committed to 100% clean energy by 2050. And there was a bill that would get us, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but to 50% class one renewables, which are defined in New Jersey as solar and wind uh, by 2030. So that's just in the next 11 years. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And that was a big priority for us. We worked very hard uh, to make that a reality in our state. And we've seen uh, big advancements in offshore wind with the largest ever commitment at 3,500 megawatts, but also the largest solicitation um, that went out in anywhere in America. Um, and another big priority for us is related to flood defense, uh, making sure that concrete and pavement in our state, which, you know, we're the most densely populated state, that we're able to take that water, capture it, hold on to it, and clean it up before it goes back into the ground. And we call that stormwater. And we have a bill that we supported, stormwater utilities that sits on the governor's desk right now, that would enable local municipalities to actually handle this water and put in some infrastructure to deal with the legacy uh, construction and development that's already occurred. New construction is actually doing pretty well as it relates to uh, polluted runoff and, and handling that. Um, and we have a couple other things we're working on. Electric vehicles, really important, half of our emissions, uh, greenhouse gases, and also um, you know, cancer-causing emissions come from transportation. So if we can get electric vehicles to be a reality, if we can get our buses, particularly school buses for our little ones, uh, electrified, we can go a long way to moving us to a, a real safe and clean uh, air uh, that we so depend on in our state. Um, and with that, uh, that tells you a little bit about what we've been up to at the state level. We obviously have some priorities at the national level too that relate back to our families. Um, so what has Congressman Malinowski been up to in just five and a half, maybe six weeks since he's been in Congress? And so we put together a, a short list, which I'm gonna to refer to my notes, um, to give some highlights in a short amount of time. Um, Congress, Congress members don't just deal with one issue. Unfortunately, they don't just work on the environment, which would be a gift to New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. They work on a plethora of issues, uh, particularly with the uh, Republican um, president, President Donald Trump, uh, with new issues coming up every every week. Um, so we 
put together a little list of uh, what has happened in the short amount of time um, uh, in front of the congressman uh, to help New Jerseyans. Um, by way of background, I think it's important for folks to understand that uh, drilling is a really uh, critical issue for our state. The shore is a, is a gem. Um, and so he co-sponsored the Coast Anti-Drilling Act, which was introduced just a few days after his inauguration. And uh, past December, on a, uh, he spoke and joined a group of bipartisan elected officials, uh, conservation leaders, and citizen landowners whose land has been seized by the Penn East Company uh, to build a pipeline. And he stood up in opposition to that project because it's not going to serve any public benefit. In addition, in just uh, September, uh, he met with homeowners in Hunterdon County to tour the properties impacted by the Penn East Pipeline um, and that construction. So we'll get a chance to hear a little bit about that. Now, he's had some town halls um, and, and talking a lot about how disproportionately our communities are impacted by the decisions of other states and as they relate to air pollution. Um, he's supporting legislation to require the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to have more public input before they approve pipeline projects. Um, we're facing 12 fossil fuel infrastructure projects here in New Jersey, uh, none of which uh, you know, people are clamoring for. Um, and these really stand against the governor's vision of 100% clean energy future. But uh, some of these actually go through the federal uh, process. Um, so this legislation um, would help to be more uh, stringent with their application. Um, and then something that's important has been around for quite some time is the uh, Gateway Tunnel, once known as the Arc Tunnel, sort of re-envisioned. Um, and he's been a strong advocate for building that across the Raritan Valley line, which is, which is really critical as well. And if you don't know uh, the Congressman's background, this is where I get to get to questions, um, but before starting in Congress, he served as a former Assistant Secretary of State, um, and that was for democracy, human rights, and labor during the Obama administration and a former director of Human Rights Watch. Um, he unseated a long-term incumbent Republican, uh, Leonard Lance, um, who I have some familiarity with if you're running uh, against him in 2010. Um, we're pleased to have him in Congress and uh, I'm gonna move on to a question. Did you right. want to do an opening statement? You want to say anything before we go to questions? Uh, I, no, I can't possibly. Add to All right. All right. Well, Except I'm now the proud owner of an electric vehicle. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Are you having any trouble with range anxiety? That's so that, okay. How it really goes far, I guess. Oh, that's good. So range anxiety is one of these issues that comes up when people buy electric vehicles. Um, there's some pending legislation in New Jersey to make significant investments. So electric vehicle owners don't have to worry as they travel around the state for work or pleasure. Um, they can get where they need to go without having to worry uh, without running out. Yeah, yeah. we would certainly encourage more people to, to do it. But yeah, it's really actually a lot of fun driving them. Wow, it's an amazing car. Yeah, yeah. it's um, the future is hard to see, but it's here today with electric uh -huh. vehicles. Yeah. Um, so we're really, really pleased Although to. There's a challenge there because a lot more people driving electrical vehicles, right? And, and the only way to deal with climate change is to actually rely more on electricity, uh, electric power generation to meet more of our needs, which means we're putting even more pressure um on the electric grid even as we have to limit uh the means of generating electricity and yeah. so that's one of the the, the challenges we're going to have to overcome to meet those goals agree uh, they are more efficient at least 30 percent um even with current fossil fuel energy production uh, so that makes a huge difference but certainly as we have more renewables creating the energy for cars right. um, that's a better situation and uh we've got to push that as well so, so the first question really has to do at the federal level with the land and water conservation fund mm -hmm. um so the senate passed a piece of legislation which is headed over to the house if you want to share a little bit about it and you know when it comes over your way what your plans are uh, to support it um uh, it's very important to New Jersey as it relates to uh, land preservation, a lot yeah. of uh, ecological programs that we count on. It, it supports a lot of programs in the 7th District uh, as well, the rare food river watershed, uh, preservation of the highlands. Uh, a, a lot of the beauty that we um, should not take for granted in this part of New Jersey is supported by, uh, by this federal program. It's had bipartisan support for many, many years, and yet somehow it was allowed to expire in the last Congress. So we're acting on it. The Senate thankfully passed a reauthorization, uh, I think just last week. Yeah. I expect that we will have a chance to vote for it in the House next week. Wow, that's great. Uh, that's my understanding. I hope so. I certainly vote for it uh, when it comes up. 
And because every day uh, that uh, this, this, uh, this act goes unauthorized, uh, we're losing about $2 million in support for uh, environmental preservation programs across the country. And New Jersey being a donor state, which means we pay more in taxes than we get back. Uh, yes. <laughs> this is we probably... Pay, I, I will quote this until we solve it, 74 cents. We get 74 cents back from the federal government for every dollar we send to Washington. And do you know what the average American uh, gets from the federal government for every dollar they send? No, I don't know the number. A dollar ten. Ah. Because we're running a deficit. Yeah. Right? And, and so actually most people, it's more than a dollar ten. There is no federal deficit when it comes to New Jersey. Yeah. Our taxpayers are experiencing surplus in the sense that we're sending a lot more than we're getting back. And so I feel absolutely within our rights to be fighting for federal funding for New Jersey, whether it's for conservation programs or for infrastructure uh, or other things that we need. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Gateway Project? Sure. Um, you know, we talked about the transportation. It's a funding issue. Sort of what is your take on uh, what the opportunity there is, uh, what the sort of time horizon is, sort of if there's uh, bipartisan support for getting this tunnel, which uh, is much needed and long overdue, uh, to become a reality. Yep. Um, 1905, if you were a commuter trying to get to New York from northern New Jersey, it would take you, depending on where you lived, 50 minutes to an hour from like Union County, mm -hmm. New Jersey, from the Morristown area. 112, 13 years later, we've shaved at best five or 10 minutes off of that route. And if you're on the Raritan Valley line where you have to change mm -hmm. trains to get to New York, it's about the same as it was in 1905. Right. That's how little progress we've made. It's shameful. And the other part of it is, of course, the tunnel we are using was built in 1910. And did you get a chance to go in there? I've seen it, yes. And what do you think? I don't recommend it. <laughs> <You're scared. laughs> so it's best to go so, through without the lights on. Yeah, <laughs> like I've been through that tunnel. We've been through that tunnel yeah. hundreds of times yeah. in our life. And the experience of it is like you're riding your train and someone turns the lights off and then you're in Penn Station. Right. You don't ever experience tunnel. Yeah. But if you go through and you stop and someone turns the lights on, you see just how much decay there has been. Yeah. In that incredibly old piece of infrastructure. Now, folks shouldn't worry, it's not about to collapse. The problem is that the repairs are mounting so that, you know, every night they have to go in there when the trains aren't running that often, like 3, 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. But the more repairs, the longer time they will need every single night to make those, to make the fixes until more and more trains get delayed and canceled and you have effectively the collapse of railway traffic. Uh, not just for New Jersey commuters, but across the Northeast corridor, which yeah. is a disaster we cannot afford, cannot allow to happen. So we desperately need this new tunnel. Now, where are we? Um, Christie canceled the art tunnel, big mistake. So we're trying to build yeah. a gateway, uh, which is not just the tunnel, it's the portal bridge, it's a few other projects along the path, it's expanding Penn Station, which mm -hmm. we need to do. It's going to be very expensive. We need federal help. It's supposed to be 50 50 federal state. And the Trump administration, uh, I think Trump realized how much we want it mm -hmm. and therefore decided we can't have it because we want it. Mm -hmm. uh, Blue states, Chuck Schumer, it's lots of going on. There's into New York, which is sort of his home state. Yeah. Yeah. The more we want it, the more he sees it as perhaps a bargaining mm -hmm. trip. Although interestingly, he never said, I'll give you the gateway for the wall. Right. I don't know what was going on there. So we now have a Democratic House. It's committed to building projects like this. Uh, I'm on the Transportation Committee. We're going to bring the Transportation Committee, I think, fairly soon to New Jersey to come see awesome. the Gateway route. Mm -hmm. It will be a top priority. I think that we have a good chance this year to get bipartisan infrastructure legislation through. By good chance, I don't mean a guarantee. Right. Never I mean, a guarantee. I mean, just, you know, in, in today's Washington terms, a realistic chance. Mm -hmm. And I will be fighting like hell to make sure that that includes funding for Gateway and that we overcome the obstacles that the Trump administration has placed in our way. The yeah. first bill addresses that. Yeah, I know it's interesting because a lot of folks think it's not an environmental issue, it but is. as we mentioned, transportation such a rail. Yeah, it's yeah. so important. And also having it be reliable, that's critical, mm -hmm. right? And we want it to be affordable as well, which is you know another issue which rates have you know sort of skyrocketed 
Um, but when you can't count on it being on time, people go back under the roads and that's a whole nother headache for commuters and um, just the wrong direction for our state. Yeah, that's, that's the oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about pennies. Mm -hmm. So you had a chance to get out there and look at the route. Mm -hmm. um, give us an update on, you know, what you've learned and what you see as far as opportunities. Um, you know, this is a local issue, but it's also an interstate is issue. Yeah. Um, and FERC is going to be uh, looking at this and, and what you might be able to do to help stop the unneeded pipeline. Yeah, well, I've, I've talked to a lot of the landowners affected by this along the route and seeing their land. And, you know, we can read position papers and policy papers that tell us why we don't need this pipeline. But when you see the people who have invested decades of their lives in to making this land beautiful and bountiful and, and suddenly someone is telling them uh, we're coming through we're taking some of your land to build this thing and we're giving you almost nothing in return and it's just heartbreaking mm -hmm. uh, and infuriating and um, you know, maybe if there was a solid economic argument for this project you could say, okay, they're trade-offs, sometimes we have to sacrifice, but then you realize there's not an economic argument for it. Mm -hmm. There's not demand for this natural gas, except, well, you know what happened, how, how, the pipe, how they demonstrated to FERC that there was demand, that basically the company that is building the pipeline is owned by the companies that will be purchasing the gas. And all they need is a contract. All they need is a contract, so yeah. it's self-dealing and federal law allows this. Mm -hmm. And that's where Congress should come in. And that's what I think we need to look at. Congress can't pass a bill saying you can't build Penn East. It's gonna be dealt with, I think, at the state level. Mm -hmm. But Congress can examine the system that allowed Penn East to be built. Mm -hmm. It can change that system. That's what I wanna to try to work on. Well, we need the help. Um, I mean, certainly a lot of these pipelines are uh, you know, proposals and it's really rigged against the uh, you know, the local communities, mm -hmm. even if they say there's a need, the threshold for demonstrating need is paper thin, yeah. um, literally paper purchase mm -hmm. orders. Yeah. Um, and uh, the threats are real. And it's the kind of infrastructure that we're not going to get a chance to enjoy into the future. Also, they put a huge demand on the uh, pricing um, as it relates to right now rushing in gas. So we have enough. We have enough way into the future in New Jersey. Um, so really all this stuff is really, it's just profit line. Well, yeah, and you know why they built it? Because the law guarantees profit. Yeah, uh, not all these. It's important to propose that so, so utilities are guaranteed to profit. They're guaranteed to profit. That's why they can take the demand. Yeah. Because whether they're customers for the gas or not, they're guaranteed. And, and so one of our suspicions is that um, the way that the profit, the guaranteed profit will be paid is by hiking rates. Yeah. Because that may be the only way to do it. Which is generally what we see with a lot of this infrastructure. Exactly. So, so as we move to uh, renewable economy in New Jersey, we've already got a law on the books. Um, solar and wind, half of mm -hmm. our energy supply um, by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that goal is, you know, in works as it relates. Um, how do you see uh, at the federal level um, something similar? You know, we are working tooth and nail here in New Jersey with Governor Murphy and the legislature, bipartisan support for uh, climate legislation. Um, but there's obviously other states that are on the losing end. President Trump pulled us out of that Paris Accord. Um, what can Congress do, a Democratic Congress with a Republican Senate, to push back at this time to make meaningful progress on a, a real threat? For our future um, that's affecting our lives every day with more frequent and intense storms at a minimum not to mention you know sea level rise that we're experiencing um are you some sort of fear monger <laughs> no i mean <laughs> is there anyone who knows fine, me it's <laughs> they, they definitely would say that's not the case <laughs> uh, look it's, it's an existential threat and i completely support what new jersey is doing new jersey and california are trying to keep us in the Paris Accords. That's what will happen in the next two years. States are leading the way, and uh, you know California particularly significant because when they move, the market moves. Mm -hmm. It sends a signal to the private sector that we are at least part of the country, increasing part of the country, is honest to goodness committed to this 2030-2050 goal. Yeah. And the private sector will do its part so long as they 
have um, the certainty that that's what the market is going to demand of them, which is why setting these ambitious but realistic goals is very, very important. So I'm really glad New Jersey has followed suit. I hope other states will. In the next two years, we have divided government in Washington. We're not passing anything like that. We have to be very real about this between now and 2020. What we can try to do is keep the Trump administration from taking us further backwards. We can try to make sure that EPA enforces the laws that are still on the books, that they don't gut any further environmental regulations. So the states will play offense. They will be leading us. Uh, we will play defense in the House of Representatives, exercising those checks and balances that voters sent us there to exercise. And then hopefully in 2020, we're going to elect a president and a Senate that will join us in taking more ambitious steps that are supportive of what the states are doing. Um, I will be supporting uh, a climate fee and dividend uh, plan, and that will be introduced in this Congress. I doubt it will pass in this Congress, but I will be supporting it and arguing for it. Uh, because that's something real. That's something that economists, liberal and conservatives agree, will create the incentives that the private sector needs to get us across the finish line. Yeah, I mean, states certainly are on the front lines right now of climate change. Um, and it's great to see progress. It's good to see New Jersey back in the leaderboard, a leader position with uh, California and New York trying to really make bold leaps um, to tackle this problem. But if we're really going to get to the root of it, we're going to need. Congress's help. We're going to need more federal uh, sorts of uh, action. You know, uh, we're seeing, I think, um, hundreds of candidates, almost 600 candidates for office, uh, you know, looking at uh, what they can do at the local level, at the state level, governors taking action. So uh, certainly many of us are chomping at the bit for federal opportunity and would love to work with you as um, this Congress progresses and whatever the future holds. Yeah, I think we're one election away from where we need to be. But we have to we have to be very smart about what we do between now and then to make sure that we win that election. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and when we look at New Jersey, I mentioned the fact that we're the most densely populated state. Mm -hmm. um, with that comes some challenges. It's a great place to live. We're right between New York City, right between Philadelphia. We've got really good local jobs. We've got a lot of opportunity uh, for New Jersey to continue to be an economic leader. We're the medicine chest of the world. We want to keep ourselves at the, the top of that. But we also have with that um, ailing sort of systems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Newark, we have things called combined sewers, where when you flush the toilet, and it adds to the rainwater in the street. And on a light rain day, it's able to be treated, right? Because in an urban area, you've got runoff from cars and other sorts of pollutants that go into the storm drain. So you do want to clean it. But when it rains a lot, they open up a valve and it's a combined sewer overflow and it goes right out to the river. That happens 200 places across the state of New Jersey um, from small rainstorms, not massive floods. We're not talking Floyd or Sandy. Uh, we're talking last year, the wettest year on record. Um, so stormwater is something we're tackling at the state level, um, but infrastructure in general. Um, we heard Governor Murphy in his last uh, State of the State address talk about needing the federal government to help solve our aging infrastructure needs. So. There's two parts to it as we see it at New Jersey Legal Conservation Voters Education Fund. One is on the stormwater side, so that when it's raining, we can really handle it, clean up the polluted runoff, and make sure we're getting it back with clean drinking water, and then also to prevent people from flooding. Um, and the other part is on our drinking water infrastructure. Lead, uh, we've got pipes made of wood in, you know, in, our, in our towns and local municipalities. Um, so what's happening in that area for funding uh, that we can count on in Jersey to keep us at the top uh, to be attractive for businesses. Because without good, cheap, reliable, clean water, businesses are going to leave. Um, and a lot of water intense businesses call New Jersey home for that reason. And we got to make sure we're competitive. Yep. Uh, well, this is something that I hope we will be able to address in an infrastructure bill this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you mentioned aging infrastructure. It's not so much that we're densely populated, it's that we're an old state. Yeah. We're a state that industrialized early. And so we've got a lot of old infrastructure. And, you know, we talked about the tunnel, hundred years, more than a hundred years old. These bridges that were built uh, in the very early era of bridge building in the yeah. United States. Um, you know, if you're Arizona, you're building stuff from scratch, and you build it better. You build it to 21st century standards from the very beginning. Right. Um, 
So we have to make sure that an infrastructure bill um, addresses the needs of states that um, are in our particular situation. And also, and you know, I'm as guilty as anyone of talking about infrastructure in terms of bridges and roads and tunnels, the things that we see. Yeah. But there's the infrastructure underneath that most, uh, most of us don't see, take for granted even though we depend on it. Um, storm water and pipes uh, that deliver uh, our water to our homes. All of that is very old in New Jersey and yeah. needs a lot of work. And I, I, again, if we have a chance to do a more comprehensive infrastructure bill, we're definitely going to look to address those things as well and, and to do it in, in a way that is environmentally sensitive because we want that next generation of infrastructure to contribute to our goal of making this country uh, clean and green by 2050. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think when we're talking about older and more densely populated, um, why that's important, the old part, we have failing infrastructure that's older, but in the old days, we'll say, um, they didn't deal with stormwater very well. Um, and so there's really no infrastructure. A lot of our suburban communities, they, they build huge uh, shopping centers and there was nothing to catch the water. So they put impervious surface everywhere, buildings, concrete pavement, and now the water has no place to percolate into the ground and it's running off you know, whatever it's picking up in the, those surfaces into the river, and there's overflowing houses are flooding that didn't use to flood. So that's why I, I we weren't thinking. <laughs> we were thinking. I think, uh, yeah, well, time tells, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of folks have stories where I didn't use to flood, and they built that thing up the stream or uphill for me, and now my basement floods. Now I need a sump pump. Now I need a French drain. Now, and that's all because we're you know, traditional development uh, really didn't take that into account. And that is separate from drinking water. Uh, so I think whatever package comes, I would just flag having funding in there that helps us to deal with this legacy stormwater um, from already developed land would be really good for our state. I think. That's a classic example of why we do need government. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have a healthy mistrust of government in the United States. And I say healthy because sure. there's a tension there. You know, you don't, I don't want too much government in my life. But the problem you just described, somebody builds a shopping mall upstream from you and then your basement starts flooding. There's no market solution right. to that problem. No, that can only be solved by citizens organizing governments to, yes, impose regulations, reasonable regulations that, that protect us from, from that kind of um, selfish action. Yeah. And, um, so that's something to keep in mind. And you know, we have these debates all the time, the balance between free market and regulation. And, and yes, there has to be a balance, but there is absolutely a place for, for the government to you know, protecting us, protecting our health, protecting uh, our water and our air. And, and in the example you mentioned, the security of our homes, yeah. the integrity of our homes. Yeah, it's not, nothing's worse than a flooded basement. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing so many vacuum um, rooms. So I just want to remind folks that have joined us, uh, if you have a question, you just hit the little chat button. If you're joining us on Zoom, um, we'll be looking at some of the questions from folks that are participating. If you don't have the chat button on Zoom, um, click the more button, it's three dots, um, and you will get it to appear. In addition, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, uh, just add it into the uh, sort of chat. Um, we like likes and hearts, all those wonderful emojis we're very, very happy with. Um, so I'm going to switch over to some questions. Um, let's see. You already talked about this one, um, so we're not going to cover it, but the question was on um, carbon uh, dividend, and yes. you said there's some legislation coming. Do you want to put a finer point on um, so energy there, innovation and, and what that means for some folks who may not be aware of that? Sure. That is? And there are different versions of this, yeah. but the basic idea is that we should put a price on carbon mm -hmm. that reflects the actual cost of pumping carbon into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the price of pumping the oil in Saudi Arabia, but the, but the price that we pay as a society. Um, so that would be a tax on, on, uh, on carbon products, gasoline, home heating oil. Yes, we would pay that tax. It would go to the government, but the government would then return the revenues to the American people in the form of a dividend. Okay. Um, some communities that might get more, like you know, folks living in coal mining country, um, where they're going to need to make a transition. Um, but basically, if you're using clean energy, if you've got you know 
if you invest in solar, if you invest in renewable energy in your home, you will still get that dividend, but you'll be paying much less of the tax. So it's a huge incentive for you to do that. And if you're an energy company, say you're ExxonMobil, it creates a huge incentive for you to transition to becoming a clean energy company because the clean energy you sell will not be subject to that tax. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of giving the private sector the incentives it's, it needs to move us as rapidly as possible to a clean energy future. And it's something that has the chance, I think still, although if anything that's real is controversial mm -hmm. in our country, it has the chance of uniting people on both sides, uh, including uh, those in the private sector who get it, who get we've got to transform our economy, but want the certainty uh, that those kinds of uh, those kinds of measures would give them. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you do on sort of there's you know a couple of hiccups with uh, um, sort of carbon fee and dividend approach? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of them has to do with at the beginning when you figure out the whole market and all the carbon. Um, there are some systems that allow for an auction where people actually have to pay for the ability to pollute. Right. I think some legislation that's has cap, that's more like cap and trade. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of it has had uh, auctions where people mm -hmm. are paying into that versus just saying, you know, you're the biggest polluter, so you get a lot of credits. Those credits are worth something later. So now, not only have you been making a lot of money and polluting, which is harming our health, now you've gotten rewarded, you know, to get these credits. So, um, so this isn't a credit system. This okay, is, so it's really just putting a, a, a price, a tax on, on carbon. Okay. Uh, and it would start fairly low and it would go up. Over time. Over time. To give people a chance to adjust. To adjust, that's right. And so if you're, if, you know, if you're an energy company that produces natural gas, suddenly that natural gas becomes more expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so clearly you have an incentive to invest in renewable energy, to be that company that leads us into that future. There would be great competition among companies to be the first <laughs> to, yeah. to master the new, the new technology. Uh, the new technology would be cheaper because it wouldn't have the, the tax attached to it. And again, if you're a consumer, you're getting the same dividend, mm -hmm. no matter what. So if you if you go completely off fossil fuels as a consumer, I'm not saying that's easy or you could do it right away, but if you did it theoretically, you would still get the same dividend back from the federal government, which you wouldn't be paying tax at all. Right. So clearly it would give you an incentive uh, to to do that. So it, and, and some in the private sector like this because it actually relies less on regulation on the federal government getting into the details of how they run their business, but it just creates a massive incentive for them to change on their own. Yeah, and this is something that's been had bipartisan support. Um, it's had some bipartisan in support, yeah. yeah. So, and, and I, you know, I know Republicans who tell me privately that for it, they're still a little scared. Yeah. Because it's a tax, even right. though the American people get it back, right. it can still be demonized by, by the other side. And so we're gonna have to have some courage to go ahead and, and do this. Right. Um, now, if we go ahead and set goals and say, we got to be, you know, we, we have to be able to generate electricity with, without fossil fuels um, by a certain date that is ambitious, but realistic. It's got to be realistic. Yeah. Um, that also incentivizes policymakers to, to pass legislation that helps us get there. So all these things can work together. Awesome. So New Jersey, uh, the next question here is about mm -hmm. PFAS. Um, which was a precursor to know that it. So it's, I'm going to get it wrong and I shouldn't because I'm a chemist, but it's polyfluoro uh, stuff. It's a precursor to Teflon. Okay. Um, and it's made its way into our waterways. It's not right. regulated. Um, I think New Jersey DEP is looking at putting a, a limit on that. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that something that you're looking at, maybe not just in relation to the specific contaminant, which mm -hmm. has high concentrations mostly in, in northern New Jersey, but can be found mm -hmm. pretty much in any water sample uh, in our state. Um, are there other sorts of contaminants that you uh, are looking at at the federal level at this point? Yeah, so I'm not a chemist. Yeah, and I am, and I can't get well, there. there you go. So. <laughs> it shouldn't be up to me, right, yeah. to make these decisions, except, except in this way, that I want to be guided by science. Yeah. I want to be guided by facts. I think our environmental policies have to be guided by science. And so my responsibility is if, if people come to me and say the science tells us that this is a contaminant that threatens the health and safety of the people who I represent, my duty is to do something about it. We can definitely get your information on this. Okay. This is pretty well uh, documented. Right. 
Um, and this is why, you know, I don't take money from the companies that do this stuff or any company. Yeah. Stuff, anyway. yeah. Um, I'm going to be guided by the science and by the interest of my constituents. Um, We'll get you some info. Good. Um, and I'll get the whole acronym spelled out, and you'll be uh, you'll be singing. Um, so, given your given your background, um, you know, when you worked for human rights and in Washington, working internationally for human rights, um, how is that translating to the work that you're doing as a member of Congress, and particularly as it relates to the environment? You know, what are the similarities? What are some of the experiences that you bring um, that, as you plot out the rest of your uh, tenure in Congress, you bring to the table from that? that strong background? So I've been both an activist and an insider yeah. in my career. Uh, I've been, I've worked for this wonderful non-governmental organization, Human Rights Watch, which fights from the outside to change government policy so that governments don't abuse people's basic human rights so that our government, the United States government, stands with people around the world who fight for their human rights. And by the way, a lot of the folks we were fighting for those activists or environmental activists yeah. in countries where, you know, if you challenge a, a dam on a river uh, or a polluter uh, dumping toxic waste in, uh, in a stream, you can get a bullet in the back of your head. Yeah. And so human rights, environmental justice, these are all related issues. Right. Um, but I also come from, I come from that tradition of, of fighting from the outside. To change government policy and I've also had a lot of stints where I've been an insider mm -hmm. where folks like you from LCB come to me and and say here's what we need you to do and I've got to figure out the practical way to work within the institution within the Congress within the executive branch overcoming resistance to get things done mm -hmm. and I think that, um, that that prepares me well for the really interesting challenge of uh, the next couple of years especially of uh, serving in a democratic house with president trump as president with all of these existential threats uh, to the health of our planet to the health of our constitution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that will require the congress and civil society to act together well it's it's we're lucky not to get shot for our beliefs um and it's hard to imagine right that in other places in the world that's a reality but we have seen more and more pressure coming down on on folks to sort of silence opposition and um you know i think one of the great things about the american people is we have a way about making sure people hear our voices and i encourage all the folks that are that are joining us to really stay involved in every way they can on issues they care about whether i'm hoping it's the environment because you're here but it's one of many you're probably working on and um, it's more more important than ever, and we are in very difficult times as uh, the balance of power has been, you know, thrown into uh, sort of disarray or been challenged in a lot of ways. And um, you know, I'm hopeful that there will be resolution, and we will continue to have a very strong uh, fabric of, of American democracy. But it's a people's government. You're a person before you got elected to Congress. You didn't have Congress person in front of your name, um, and People can get involved in their local uh, governments and you know run for office, which is a great way to represent your community. You can stay involved by pushing the people who are in office to do the right thing and educating them on um, different policies, which is I think really critical and I'm really elected officials are dependent on um, because otherwise there's just such a wall between things. And uh, part of what we're doing here today is starting that conversation uh, early in your term uh, with, with folks that we have an opportunity to, to speak with all the time. But I want to encourage everyone um, to not be complacent, um, to continue to um, stay active and involved in whatever way you can. Um, sometimes that's you know, volunteering, sometimes that's writing a check, sometimes that's um, writing an email. Um, there's just lots of ways that um, everyone can have their voice be heard and, and we really are, as an organization, uh, are nothing without our members and the people that are our supporters. Um, we wouldn't be able to be here today, we wouldn't be able to have internet connections and technology and, um, you know, the ability to have staff to do research. So uh, we're really, uh, you know, grateful uh, for that. Um, I guess one one other question that uh, sort of comes up here is um, it is sort of we've talked about a little bit is around bipartisanship, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah we have divided government now. Uh, New Jersey is a, a you know, 
know, a very bipartisan state or multipartisan. I mean, the environment doesn't seem to be a partisan issue in our state as much as it is in some of my colleagues that are across the country where, um, you know, sort of each party has carved out a position, pro-environment or anti-environment. Uh, we've seen it in New Jersey, uh, a lot of support from elected officials for common sense solutions to environmental challenges. Um, at the federal level, we might be seeing a little bit more of a bifurcation in that position. Um, and as it relates to other issues, what has been your take so far on bipartisanship? Does it really exist? Are colleagues colleagues? Um, and how much do we need that? Uh, you know, I think we desperately need it. Like on one level, we don't need it in the House of Representatives because if I'm part of the Democratic majority, we can pass whatever we want. Yeah. But that's not going to help heal the divisions in this country mm -hmm. uh, if we just take that attitude. Uh, it's also not going to get anything passed through the U.S. Senate either, right? right? Because so we, we need Republican support for what we do in the House if we're going to have any chance of passing things through the Senate and yeah. making the law. But more importantly, we so desperately need to find opportunities for common ground on these issues because we want to model for the American people that we're still one country, even though we disagree on, and we should disagree on, on a lot of things, that we are still Americans. There are forces that are trying to divide us, including from beyond our borders. Yeah. And they had a lot of success in the 2016 election. And I think we're seeing a, a visceral reaction from many Americans right now saying, we do not want to be divided over stupid shit. Yeah. If I can say that. It's the internet. It's, sure. it's, it, it, we, we, we fundamentally do agree on the same things. And on the environment, um, Republicans and Democrats have some disagreements about regulation. I've never met a Republican in the seventh district who's told me I want my water to be unhealthy for my children to drink. That's right. I want my air to be unhealthy for my children to breathe. Everybody understands that the government, which is basically the American people working together, has a role to play in protecting us mm -hmm. from pollutants. Everybody understands that, yeah, the climate is changing and we need policy to address that, mm -hmm. even though the answers are complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see that in other issues. I, I'm very, very interested in foreign policy. As you know, I worked yeah. at the State Department. And already in my first six weeks in Congress, I've introduced two bills on foreign policy, national security issues, with the same number of Republican and Democratic co-sponsors. I managed to pull that group yeah. together. Um, so that's an area where people agree. Public health and safety, people agree. Um, patriotism, defending our country from foreign adversaries, people tend to agree. Protecting our constitution, people agree. And you will see very soon, I'm certain, a very strong vote in the House and in the Senate to try to overturn the state of emergency that President Trump just imposed, not because uh, we all agree on building a wall or not building a wall on the Mexican border, but because Republicans and Democrats fundamentally agree the Constitution has to be protected. Presidents can't just steal money that the Congress hasn't given them. That's wrong. So I'm, I'm looking for those opportunities to find common ground and then build on it so that when we talk about something we really do disagree about, we can do it in a more friendly and constructive way without demonizing each other. Even if at the end of the day, I'll be voting yes and my Republican colleagues will be voting no. We, I think we've seen some of that, um, you know, in the new Congress, uh, sort of not the same rhetoric uh, that's partisan, mm -hmm. um, but really saying we're going to look into this issue, we're going to be thorough, we're going to work with our colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say as a, a you know, someone watching from afar, that's something that's very appreciated. I think particularly in your part of the state, but in particularly in this time, it couldn't be more important for us to see folks working together, you know, towards the same goals, making America safer and stronger um, for our future generations so we can hand them better uh, everything. I want to talk about land and water and air, but it really goes across the gamut.
sure. civil rights and, and other things. So this has been a great conversation. We're sort of at the, the end here, and I was not able to get to some of the questions folks um, provided. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe we can look at other ways to um, you know get answers. We had some questions here on, uh, let's see, on the, uh, the New Green Deal. We had questions regarding um, the environment as it relates to the economy and union labor um, and local jobs um, and many others that we, we didn't have a chance. So um, if people wanted to chat with you, um, either in person or wanted to send you their thoughts, um, what's the best way to do that? If you could share it, or I guess we could send it back around, but really quickly, if you have a, a way they can officially connect with you about ideas that they have or feedback on today's conversation, any issues that matter to them. Well, there are lots of ways. Um, you can send an email or write a letter to the, the various addresses that we provide on our website. Okay. Um, you can tweet at me if you like. What's the web address? Just the web address? Yeah. I don't know. Oh. Google it. <laughs> you got to Google it. All right. All right. It's I easy. knew it by heart. I like... think you can find Congressman Malinowski. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and that's me. One thing I have in common with President Donald Trump is you cannot tear my Twitter away from me. That's <laughs> my voice, and I try to and I try to follow what people your are name? saying to me. At Tom Malinowski. It's at Tom Malinowski. At, no, at Malinowski. At Malinowski. Just at Malinowski. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's also Facebook. You can message us on Facebook, uh, and come to events. We, you know, every time I'm in the district, I try to do. Uh, some public events, town halls uh, of different kinds. We're doing some this weekend, although those are going to focus on the SALT deduction issue, which is yeah. you know, very important to a lot, of, a lot of our constituents. Yeah. Uh, so come to events when I'm in your hometown, um, and we advertise those on our Facebook page, so you can follow follow it there. Um, and I, you know, my my goal is to uh, be as available as possible to answer people's questions, to take constructive criticism because eventually we all have to make tough choices that some people are going to disagree with. And, uh, and I want to hear from people who, um, who disagree with me as well and engage with, with everybody respectfully. Awesome. Um, so keep in touch. Uh, this is Congressman Tom Milanowski. Thank you so much for taking Thanks, the time to join us today. Hope we can follow up with a conversation you know, maybe next year and see what the progress list looks like on environmental issues and other matters that relate to New Jersey. And uh, keep Let's up do that. Work. Thank you. Thank you guys.